Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Harris with Educational Data Systems, and I want to thank everyone for coming out to this year's IAAC conference. It's also our pleasure this morning to introduce Mr. John Corcoran, our keynote speaker. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet him or listen to him speak before, you're in for a really wonderful morning. His passion is contagious, and it's truly inspiring. Reading at a second grade level until the age of 48, Mr. Corcoran has overcome his own literacy challenges to become a school teacher, a successful author, and an advocate for literacy using radio, television, and speaking engagements across the country to raise literacy awareness and challenge educators to improve the lives of both youth and adults across our nation. So please join me in welcoming Mr. John Corker. I uh, brought a video uh, to start the presentation, and it's uh, Voices and Faces of adults that have learned to read. I want to share that with you. And uh, technology, we're waiting for it. <laughs> No one, no one. Not my mom, not my dad, they were always working. It really wasn't a strong part of my growing up. I really didn't have anyone reading to me. I don't remember my mother sitting down and reading books with me. There was no books, dude. You lucky we had furniture in our house. I grew up in a house with a mother that was a teenager and my mom was 19 years old and she had three kids and she was a baby herself. In the second grade, I ended up in the dumb row, uh, where the little boys and little girls that uh, struggled with reading sat. Yeah, but I had some very intelligent cousins, and that, that was intimidating all through elementary school. So little by little, I just pulled away from the family. You find tricks to, um, to not read. I tell people where I couldn't see you because I didn't have glasses, and I would break my glasses so I could keep using it as an excuse. Or just, if they pressed it too hard, then I'd I'd really recoil negatively and I'll get in a fight. I'll fight to to get kicked out because I knew I had to read the next day. So now my parents are going to school and uh, to have conferences with my my teachers and now they're not talking about my reading issues. They're talking about my behavior issues. Reading the pa the words I just could not I just couldn't get the grammar together. I'm going along and if somebody asked me, what did you just read? I had no idea. Because I couldn't read and stuff. I kind of, you know, mask it, played sports a little bit. You know, PE was my, my highest rank because I could run track. I could I run cross country. And I discovered music and, and that was so refreshing. That it was like my identity. I could do something. And I would draw pictures to tell a story. And the teachers thought that was the coolest, the coolest thing. And they found out that I did learn differently. I was put in a special ed class, but in the special ed class, we didn't have to do anything. So we just didn't get it, and we were just passed through. And social promotion's been going on for a long time. 
my senior years when they realized that I couldn't read and write. What happened? What did I do? What went wrong? Why did it, no one catch up with what I was going through? Why didn't nobody notice I wasn't reading and writing at that level? What happened to all that? I feel like all those years were wasted because no one really noticed. You know, as a child, I was innocent, and all children are innocent. We're, we're not cheaters. We're not liars. We go to school, and we're in the hands of adults, and they're the ones that are supposed to impart the skills and the values. It was really hard. Like I said, I didn't want it, anyone to know about it. I just wanted it to be my own secret. So I just like, pretended that I knew how to read. You know, what's that sign? Well, I remember seeing that. I look back in my mind. And stop. <laughs> if I, I wanted to get me a job, or I just wanted to go out and do something, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it unless somebody come with me and help me do it. I kind of looked for like jobs where I didn't have to read a lot. Um, you know, a lot of customer service where I'm talking on the phone or in person. From then on, it was just working as a housekeeper. That was easy. I didn't really have to read. You can't read. You're, you're, really, you're really an outsider. And it's a subculture that you belong to. And you only have one language, and it's an oral language. And the oral languages are limited. It was like this. My world was like this. It was like a box. And I was in the box. And, and I was, my face was up against the box. And all I could do is look at life pass me by. I was trying to help my son with the homework because he was the oldest. And I wanted to be different than my parents. I wanted to participate in his school and his education and his homework and books and all that. And trying to help him with the homework and not understanding the instructions and guessing them. The day my son came back and said, I don't want you to help me anymore with the homework. You're giving me the wrong answers. You're like, oh my God, you know, finally reality hits you. Just got tired of you know, having to mask the fact that I couldn't read or, you know, being around people and have to make excuses why you didn't read or you, you didn't see something right or you thought it said that. I went to a college class and I, had, and I struggled. I struggled trying to get into it, trying to understand and, and write. A certain section of my brain was storing blood since I was a child and my headache meant that section burst in my brain. My husband, he lost his kidneys. He had no kidneys. Doctor had told me that I had to be very careful because all the medications that he was getting, I could put certain medications together and I could kill him. At that moment when I woke up and I looked at my family and I couldn't say one thing, I knew that I had a lot to do. <laughs> um, I got fired from bonds, so I told my counselor everything that's happened, and I started crying and told her I was thinking about selling drugs again and robbing people. And I told my counselor I can't read and that um, I need help. It's just going to be devastated that I was going to lose. That because I couldn't read, I was I was gonna lose everything. I felt helpless. I felt weak. I felt like I wasn't good enough. So I just went and I just asked. I couldn't go on like that no more. I had. Madonna, I couldn't really help her that much because I couldn't read. Then I had April, my little seven-year-old. I couldn't help her. I didn't want to perpetuate the cycle with them, too. The drama of me telling, this is the, my wife is the only person that knows that I can't read. And I'm going to go tell somebody else. And I don't trust people. 
with that secret. I mean, that's why I guarded that secret. There was nobody I could trust with that because I knew what they thought about people that didn't know how to read. In my, in, blocked in my child's mind, they knew that I was dumb. And I went there, took an assessment on math, reading, writing, and then they came back and said, well, your assessment says that you're in a level, um, third level. I was in shock. I was like, I survived all these years with the third grade level of reading and writing. When I told my family I couldn't read, they almost passed out. They could not believe it because it's not something you share with people. You just don't. They told me they had a, a volunteer tutor, someone who was going to volunteer their time twice a week for an hour and a half to teach me to read and write. And she asks me if it's okay if she sticks me in a special class. And I tell her, yeah. So she does, and at first I felt like I wasn't like those kids in that class or those adults. But when I figure I should just give them a chance and not be judge them like people judge me, it turns out that they, we actually have a lot of things in common. Oh, when I came from my first class, I felt like I was kindergarten. It was a reading class, and we were learning with phonics. It was like finding a rainbow. And I knew that I was on my way to get help. First of all, I went through a lot of frustration, um, angry. Um, I felt a lot of times quitting. We were supposed to learn when we were from 5 to 18. We missed that. We missed all of that. We would all smile when we could say a sentence in a perfect, normal voice the right speed, then we would all just smile and we would clap for each other. She used to always tell me, you're going to go to college, and I used to always think, what's wrong with her? I don't even have my high school, I don't even have a GED, and she thinks I'm going to go to college, but she will always tell me that. You're going to go to college, you're so smart, and, and I used to always think she was crazy, but she wasn't wrong, she was right. It's like, it, it feels weird when somebody tells you they're proud of you. I'm 33 years old. I've never heard that before. It's just amazing that uh, there's a program like this. When I learned to read, I said, whoa, my stress is going away. You know, this is really a pretty good life. I'm able to pick up a magazine, pick up a book, go on the internet and research stuff if I wanted to, um, read my emails. I'm not sure, for me, it would be here. <laughs> it started here and right now I'm here and it can just go and go and go. It's, it's definitely kind of opened that, you know, social butterfly that's been kind of hiding in the cocoon this whole time, so. It's really grounding for me that, you know, I, I didn't do this by myself, you know. It was a lot of people that put in a lot of work to kind of help me get where I'm at today, and I'm just blessed. It opened this world. It made me stronger, it made me better. And like I was saying, you can tell now the difference between you and someone who's like you hiding it. sitting there and I was thinking, this audience knows we're not dumb. I don't have to explain anything to you. Uh, we just haven't learned to read yet. And we all know that it's never too late to learn to read. And that's why we're here, in a sense. Uh, one of the first things that uh, 
we do as adult, adults when we learn to read the next thing we want to do is write and and writing is a little bit more challenging than reading uh, but when you look back at it they were both pretty challenging but you have to know how to read before you can write and uh, those illiterates those what the general public calls it sometimes functional illiterates I don't know where they came up with that word functional illiterate. We're not functioning at the level we want to function at. We want to maximize our fullest potential. And you can't without those basic skills. I, uh, I wanted to tell you that what we like to do is to write. And once we start writing, for me, is my experience. I find this experience is true with uh, my fellow travelers. Uh, and we all have a story. And illiteracy in America doesn't discriminate. Those are the faces. And they, they come from every walk of life. But uh, there's, some similar, there's some similar things in all our stories. It was painful not to know how to read. And we knew. We always wanted to learn to read. Sometimes we're asked about, why did you wait so long? Well, where were you guys when we were looking for you? You weren't around, was there a hotline that we just picked up and said, hey, come over here, I need to learn to read. That didn't happen either. So, uh, anyway, as far as writing is concerned, we like to write poetry. Have any of you noticed that in your students? Like, the first thing we want to write. And a lot of times, people will say, hey, these new readers, these developing literates, they have all this passion from their experience and they want to express it in poetry. And they, they think of us as poets. And the reality is, I think, the reality is, we really don't know what a complete sentence is yet. And so we write poetry so we can take a little shortcut uh, and, and get some of this stuff out of our head. I'm still amazed when I write from the, the first thing I wrote was some poetry, and I'm going to read the, the, a couple of those poems from you, uh, to you, and I'm going to read uh, uh, one of them right now to you, and I want to read a little bit to you for about the next 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'm going to speak to you uh, about the story that you want to hear about. But I'm going to, I've got to preach and teach first, and I'm going to I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you because. I know how to read. And anytime I have an opportunity to read is a celebration. It's a joy. And especially with this group, it's a joy. It's a joy for me to witness these people speaking to you and remind you the important work that you do where you take this from, all of us, at a lot of different levels. So let me start with this poem. And uh, I see my wife just walked in. <laughs> I, I, we were up at six, you know. Sorry we were late. We were just sitting around talking. And, and, uh, and I was, I think, uh, praying that the right words came out of my mouth today. Um, reading words is quite a game, and I'm not about to complain, but I am obligated to explain some of our pain without casting any blame. We all, we all have something to gain. Childhood memories ring clear in our ear, and the images of failures are still very near. Oh, how we still fear that abandonment is near. Why we still fear is because of what we still hear. Label, label, learning to signal. Let's put all the cards on the table. An excuse, an abuse, an excuse not to produce. Just label us disabled. Perhaps those that can read just cannot conceive that our unmet need to read is causing this great nation to bleed. Don't watch us bleed. Please teach us all to read. We have a right to grieve, but we must learn how to read. Don't leave us now, please. Teach us all to read. The stage is set for basic skills. Don't expect ends and thrills. It's going to take drills and drills and drills. 
before we have those basic skills. The year 2000 was our goal. We didn't reach it, but we are not too old. Reach our goal, we must be bold. And if you agree, back your words with this deed. Roll up your sleeves and teach us all to read. The next thing I'd like to share with you is, uh, uh, is a oral piece, uh, a written piece. I'm not going to give you the written piece, but I'm going to give you the Lord. I have recently testified for a statewide uh, task force in California, special ed, and those, uh, the results of that task force was going to the state superintendent and the Department of Education and also to the uh, commissioner of teacher credentials. So I had this opportunity to speak uh, there and submit my longer written version of what I was to, to say. And I share it with you because not only was I a teacher who couldn't read, I was a little boy who couldn't read, I was a teenager who couldn't read, I was a father who couldn't read. I was a lot of things that, that uh, uh, I had a lot of roles that I played in my life and I couldn't read. But I also, after I learned to read, I have become an advocate. Uh, and uh, I want to share this with you as an advocate. And then we're going to go to the important question that you have on your mind. How did I graduate from college without knowing to read? And how did I teach school in California for 17 years without knowing how to read? That's the question. My wife says, get through this other stuff and get to the, get to the story. That's what people want to hear, okay? But uh, I feel obligated. And I'm gonna share this, uh, I'm gonna share this with you. Um, and I can remember when I couldn't uh, read and I never had to worry about notes or papers or anything. I said, I said it came out of my mouth. And uh, now I gotta get organized. And that's why I, I wanna share this with you uh, also, uh, because I wrote these words. And as I read this testimony to you, I'm not necessarily going to have a lot of eye contact with you. I know people that have their notes kind of vacant. Well, I'm not faking it. Here it is right here, and I'm going to read it to you. And uh, excuse me if I'm not having a lot of eye contact with you, uh, but i got to pay attention to these little critters on this page. And uh, these little critters have bullied me for most of my life. Printed letters and words and sentences and paragraphs, they bullied me, and they've intimidated me for a long time. And I own them. And I'm going to keep my eye on them. For <laughs> well, the first six years of my life, I was told by my parents that I was a winner. Like millions of other innocent children, I was sent off to school with high hopes of learning how to read. However, I was also one of millions of children and adults who had difficulty learning how to read. In the second grade, I ended up in the dumb room in school. I was a loser by the time I was eight years old. I did not learn as a lad of eight. I learned to read as a man of 48. And I have to say that was great. But don't you think a man who learned at 48 could have, should have learned at eight? And wouldn't that have really been great? My wife told me not to add anything to this testimony, but I, I want to add this little piece of it. And it's my poetry, too. Don't shake your head. Some of you may think I'm old, but in my mind, I don't think I'm old. When it comes to reading, I am old. Our soul, I am told. And perhaps I am old, because I know more people need to be told. That's taking care of the eight issue that you might be thinking about and wondering how old I am. Uh, and there's no retirement. As you guys, I don't know if you guys know this. Some of you probably do by now. 
There's no retirement program when you're a literacy advocate. You just keep on and on and on. And you all know, once you get bit by that thing, you know, you bit and you're committed because you know the results. My wife just went, move on. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here today. And I want to read to you, uh, actually, it's a gift, a dialogue, and it's in this testimony. Uh, and I, it's actually a prayer. Uh, so I didn't write this, but it's a prayer. And because I talk to secular audiences all the time, uh, I, I, I let God, I took him off the page, and, uh, but uh, you might fill him in if you want to. Uh, and in California, we, don't, we have to take him off the page. I don't know what they do in India. In here. Uh, it's a gift of dialogue, and I start out almost all my presentations with this uh, prayer. Uh, dialogue unties knots, opens doors, resolves conflicts, makes persons greater. It is the bond of unity and the mother of brotherhood. Make us understand that dialogue is neither an argument nor a battle of ideas, but a search for the truth between two or more people. Make us understand that we need each other and that we complement each other. We have something to give and a need to receive. I can see what others cannot, and they can see what I do not. We are here today due to the reality that 30% of our children are not being taught to read. As a result, they are falling behind, dropping out of school, feeling inadequate, not reaching their highest potential, and sadly, many are ending up in the prison systems. The key to teaching these children and adults like me to read is proper instruction, and proper instruction is delivered by teachers who have been properly trained. Today, all teachers, especially special education teachers, and all administrators, primary and secondary, and I did put a footnote in here, including adult and continuing education teachers, that's just for you guys, <laughs> need, to be, need, need to be able to demonstrate that they know how to teach a child and an adult how to read. Let's focus more on teacher training we must stop blaming teachers. They cannot teach what they don't know. Our universities and colleges must be held accountable and must train our teachers in the latest evidence-based re evidence research, giving them the tools and the methodologies to teach all learners at every level. Teaching reading is a part art, is a part heart, and an ever-growing part science. We must stop blaming learners by referring to them as learning disabled. We are learning able. We need to stop underestimating the horrendous impact the term learning disabled has on individuals and our nation as a whole. Current research tells us that we can learn to read. Neglecting to teach a child to read is a form of child neglect and perhaps even child abuse. The harm continues into adulthood and it has a demoralizing impact on individuals and our great nation. In America today, it is as important to teach an adult to read as it is to teach a child to read. I'm going to restate that. It is as important to teach an adult to read as it is to teach a child to read in America today. We can and must prevent and eradicate adult literacy by teaching children and adults how to read. Today, we use learning disability as a conventional term, originally coined in 1963. I have never been very comfortable with the conventional term used to define children and adults like me who have difficulty processing language. It's just another term for the dumb room where I resided for many years in elementary school. Now science tells us that though some may have initial difficulties processing language, over 90% of the humans are able to learn to read. The federal government has spent millions of dollars over the past half century on research and development on how the human brain learns to decode symbols to, deri to derive the uh, dig deep into the 
equally bag I got here. Uh, intentional, uh, intended meaning. We now know that there is a science to teaching breeding, and we have yet to close the gap between what we know and what we do. That's our challenge. We're not, we're not, we, we know a lot, but we just don't implement what we know. We keep, we keep perpetuating illiteracy by our past. And, and we really need to, to know what the science is. And I was certainly benefited by the heart of my volunteer tutor and the art of my volunteer tutor, but I was also a beneficiary of the science of today. Uh, and uh, uh, the term may, well, I must play, sorry, Kathy, I did add a couple footnotes to this presentation. <laughs> Learning disability is not a scientific term. It is a catch-all term that is at, at the very least confusing. In fact, 43% of Americans still incorrectly believe learning disabilities are associated with IQ. The word and language we use to describe ourselves do matter. How we use those words may well influence how others see us and how we see ourselves. The term may be well-intended, but it is damaging. If we want to progress, we must be linguistically precise. Linguistically precise. Those are 25 cent words coming out of my mouth and off of this page, don't you think? I know what it means, too. It is time to take a hard look at the harmful side, of the harmful side effects of the term that we started using in 1963. If I were in school today, I would be called learning disabled because I have difficulty learning to read and write, along with some behavior problems I acquired in the fourth, and fifth, and sixth grade. Good science is precise. Good science demands scientific language. If we change the language and labels we use for children and adults struggling with reading, it will help change our perception of them and their view of themselves. They are learning able, not learning disabled. Illiteracy is a common thread in all of our educational, social, and economic ills. Learning how to read has filled a big hole in my soul, and teaching all of our children, teens and adults, will help us fill a big hole in our country's soul. We will provide more children, youth and adults, an equal opportunity in the classroom, workplace, and community. We can learn. We are able to learn. We are able. We are not learning disabled. Thank you for allowing me to read what I have written, and I'm at your service. That's what I said to the California Task Force, and I share that with you because I want you to know what I'm saying out there. Uh, and it's really easy to talk to you, and I get to talk to you now. And I, I don't have to use those notes. Uh, and I'm told by literate people that it's hard for them to even read publicly. Uh, and my, it's probably easier for me because you guys are more empathetic. When I trip over something, you say, eh, it's still pretty good. Okay. Uh, now I want to get to the story. What's, what do you mean, Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> I have to do my preaching teaching first, and then I'll tell you about the story. Okay, uh, let's start out with the, with the little boy. Uh, and the little boy went to school for six years of my life. I was at home with my loving parents that told me every single day that I was a winner. And I went off to school with high hopes, like all children go off to school, uh, to learn to read, like my sisters, like my parents. But I got there, and I ended up in the dumb room in the second grade. Now, first grade wasn't too bad, and you want to know where my parents were. My parents were there all the time. They went to the conferences with the teachers in the first, in the first grade. They were told, John, is, he's a smart boy. He's polite. And uh, he behaves himself, and he loves recess. 
And, and I guess I would have been, if I were in school today, they might say I was ADD or something. But my parents just thought I had ants in my pants. And maybe we ought to stay with that diagnosis for children uh, and leave some of this medicine alone uh, for some of us and let us shake those ants out of our pants before uh, something gets shook out of our brains. Um, okay, I know, I'm, I'm preaching again. Uh, get back to the story. And the story is, uh, by the time I got to the second grade, and I started school, I, I, had, I had math skills. I could count money and make change before I went to school. Uh, I was curious and, and eager to learn. And in the second grade, I was, I was in that dumb book. And I didn't know how to get out. I didn't know how I got in. But I knew a bunch of us were in that row, and none of us could, could read when it was our turn. And there was always silence when reading came up, or we got into our reading groups. And the teacher didn't call that the dumb room. But the kids knew it was a dumb room because that's where all the dumb kids sat because they couldn't read. So we got the message real quick in the second grade. We go to the third grade. I'm passed on to the third grade now. That's called social promotion. How did I get to the third grade? I just was moved along. And uh, I didn't know how to read or write in the third grade. And then the fourth grade came along, and I was passed along again. I didn't turn any papers in. I couldn't, and, and the pressure's on now in the third grade, because that's when the demands for the dominant language kick in. The dominant language of education is the written word. And if you don't have the power of the written word, either to read it or write it, there is no way you can succeed. And something happens to the human spirit when they're being left out and behind. And by the time I got to the fourth grade, that Johnny the Innocent, he was now Johnny the Native Alien. He was disconnected from what went on in the classroom. It was a different world. And uh, by the time I got to the fifth and sixth grade, the Native Alien was really getting a little bigger and a little bit stronger. And, uh, he made a lot of teachers cry, but they made him cry, not publicly. And uh, that fourth grader, fifth grader, sixth grader was expelled from school, was suspended from school, had fights in school. And for me, it was always in school. School was a hostile environment. What home wasn't hostile? The playgrounds weren't hostile. It was just inside those classrooms <coughs> where I could not Please, where I could not perform, where I could not succeed. There was no equal opportunity in that classroom for me or anybody else in that dumbbell. And it's true today. We just use different words to describe those little kids that are in the dumbbell. And it's about difficulty processing language, difficulty about processing language. We're more normal than abnormal. And not knowing how to read makes us a little crazy. So the native alien got a little crazy. And I wanna, I wanna, uh, I wanna read another poem that I wrote. And actually, the subpersonality. This was really the first poem that I wrote. And uh, I wanna read it to you to give you a little bit clearer picture of those two, that little boy and that teenager or that sub teen, that middle school student, uh, that native alien. And they wrote this, they, they collaborated, and they wrote this poem, and, uh, and these feelings, and they give you a little bit more insight into uh, our feelings. And I'm looking for my glasses, like the woman on the screen there says she kept breaking her glasses, you know? And I, I used to, that's the easy one, you guys heard that one before. Left my glasses at home, will you read this for me? That's a simple little thing to do, learn. Okay, Nate Billion here from there, you can be found everywhere. Going through the motions, showing your emotions. Oh, native alien, you are lame, and literate society plays its games. They still keep looking for someone to blame. Isn't that a shame? Don't they have any idea of our pain? It seems so plain, but they still keep looking for someone to blame. What a national shame. They give us our promotions and they put us through the motions. Bluebirds here, redbirds there, 
Now we have teal birds everywhere. Oh, how we tried, oh, how we cried. We were just past by, and how we had to hide. Oh, how we had to hide. Oh, how they stole our pride. Oh, how they lied. Native alien here from there, native alien everywhere. Shame, shame, we can't read. And how this nation bleeds. But they still will not heed why Johnny, the native alien, still can't read. Oh, how we tried, oh, how many times has he died? Literate society, you can't hide. Oh, literate society, how come you lie? Scapegoat, cover up, alibi too. Oh, literate society, shame on you. Oh, literate society, you can't hide. Illiterate addicted, have your hide while you choke on your own pride. Native alien, he can't read, it limits him, we can see. But he has ideas and concepts and theories too. And that's the stuff of thought that you want to concede too. And when I wrote that poem, my, my, I was with my tutor. And uh, um, I didn't scare my tutor. But the first few times I wrote, read that, I read it to teachers. And I, I had to quit reading because it scared me too much. And I was too rough around the edges. I was still. Uh, I, uh, adults that can't read were kind of suspended in our childhood, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, intellectually, academically. And when we learn to read, we start dealing with some of these issues. And there's a confusion, there's a joy of knowing how to read. And there's an anger also that missing out on this. And um, I said there's no one to blame and I do not want to blame anybody in that this adult that stands here today, not the, the native alien wrote that. I was, I was in my body, but that little boy, those little boys live in our memory. And I'm blessed to have the opportunity to forgive myself for all my sins and crimes and trespasses against the literate society. Everything that I did, I'm gonna tell you about how I cheated the system. Now, I'm, I'm, my innocence is over. My, my, in the fifth grade, I went to school to fix a bayonet because I was going to war. I didn't have a real bayonet, uh, but I, that's the way I perceived going to, to school. And by the time I got to the eighth grade, I was so weary. I was so tired of embarrassing my parents. And you know, what happened to my reading problem? Well, in the fifth grade, it, it was not a reading problem. We didn't talk about the reading problem. My parents never went to school and talked about the reading problem. They talked about the behavior problem. This crazy kid needs a psychiatrist. His behavior is, is unbearable. I spent most of the seventh grade sitting in front of the principal's office or in the principal's office. Uh, and I went to school for 30 days one time, cut school for 30 days, and they didn't call my parents at all. They were just taking a little breather from the native baby. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, I never turned any papers in, and I never failed a class. I never did anything during that re rebellious time. And when I got to the eighth grade, I'm going into high school, I'm really, I'm really tired of losing. I lost every battle. And my parents were hurt too. And so I decided to go underground and and play the system. And I just worked, started playing the system by doing a little bit of cheating, you know, using other people's papers and turning them in. And I started because Athletics, that's my wife. And most wives fill in the missing pieces, <laughs> but she really has to fill in some missing pieces. I was gonna get the cut, but you didn't give me a chance. Uh, what was it you said? Oh, I had athletic skills. I had social skills. I had math skills. Uh, and when I, well, the other thing I did when I was going into high school, I was really highly motivated because if you misbehave, you don't get to play. I wanted to play. So I changed my whole attitude towards teachers. I thought I was gonna beat them up until I beat them. But I decided to use another strategy and kiss them until they moved me on and kept me eligible. And so 
Uh, I dated the valedictorian. I ran around with college prep kids. I turned other people's papers in. I cheated off of other people's uh, uh, test papers. And just low level cheating, but it was cheating. <laughs> I, never, I never did an honest test in my life, uh, in high school or college. I couldn't, I couldn't write a sentence when I was 48 years old. I taught school and I couldn't write a sentence. Uh, yeah. I graduated from high school and I've got an athletic scholarship. And I know a lot of you say, oh, you got an athletic scholarship and you went to college and the athletic department uh, pushed him through, <laughs> got him through. No, John Corcoran cheated. It's totally 100% my, my sin, my crime. It was me that did that. Now, you can be a little bit more empathetic for a little innocent child, and you can be a little bit empathetic for the teenager who was angry and confused, and you still, you, there's a few of those that can read, and they still have some of those behavior traits. And you all, if you know a teenager, you can kind of be empathetic. And, and uh, but when you get to college, it's a completely different moral dilemma. And uh, I, uh, I gotta tell you a little bit about, I kicked up my cheating a little bit more. And I've gotta tell you a few things about how I did that. Uh, they, uh, I belong to a social fraternity, and in the social fraternity's files, we keep files on tests that were given in the past. And some professors, lazy professors, uh, would give the same exam, you know, every three years there was a rotation. So you just found out what the rotation was and you got the copy of the test. That makes it, and that's cheating. And uh, uh, so I took advantage of that and I, uh, I went to some other extremes. And I also copied off of, of other people's paper, but I also had a lot of girlfriends during my college career. And I had to get a new girlfriend just about every semester because she didn't have the time to do my work and her work. So usually they made the decision to move forward without me. Uh, or I made the decision that, hey, I think I'm going to this one out. I got to go find another one. And, and there are plenty of pretty smart girls. And uh, so, I, that was one of my resources. I want to tell you, I got these resources, and I had some. I had a, a, a professor, Dr. Gregory, who uh, she wasn't lazy, and she was about 90 years old. She gave a midterm and a final, and it was an essay. And I had already dropped government. It was a required course in a, in our second year. I had already dropped it about five or six times because all the professors used. Uh, took essay exams, and I didn't know how I was going to get a copy of an essay exam. I didn't know what the questions were. Uh, anyway, Dr. Baby gave two exams, and she would write the four questions on the board, midterm and final. And uh, what am I going to do? So I started thinking outside of the box, she might say. And I, I had a, a buddy of mine, a friend of mine who was brilliant, a brilliant guy. He lived outside the box, he was so brilliant. And uh, I asked him if he would help me get through Dr. Gregory's class. Uh, and he said he was willing to do that. Now, he's a shy guy, brilliant guy, but very shy. And we had the, this relationship. And, and so we came up with, with a plan. Mostly, I did most of the planning, and I just directed him what to do. Uh, and what we did was, in the springtime, I sat near the window, in the back, passed my blue book out to him, and, uh, and he went under a tree to answer the questions. Now, how did the questions get in my blue book? I painstakingly copied the four questions, three of them were required, and one was bonus, by the way. Painstakingly, when I say painstakingly, I'm saying like, if we had Chinese up here on the board, and I asked you to write it down, copy it, you could painstakingly, and some of you would move up to the front to get it, and, uh, uh, but you wouldn't know what it said. So I was, I was like a scribe, and I had pretty good penmanship skills, because in my day, they taught penmanship. It was an art form, 
And so I could copy. Uh, and so I copied these, passed them out the window. And I know you're not supposed to pray when you're lying and cheating. But I was praying. My friend had the answers to those questions. And that he was going to be able to get him back into me before uh, the hour and 45, uh, it was a two hour exam, before the two hours they had to expect. And you have to be careful even in passing it back in. And you gotta, you got to think about all these details like you sit in the back because the older students usually sit in the front so they don't miss anything. So you sit in the back because also the older students, if they see you passing something out the window, they're going to rat on you. But your peers, you surround yourself with some blockers, you know? And uh, all of this is thought out. Sometimes when I tell these stories, people say, why didn't you just learn how to read? <laughs> and put your energy there. And I, was, I told you I was an athlete. I could have tutoring 24 hours a day. But I couldn't go to a tutor because I'm reading at the second grade level. I'm a college student. Yep. Uh, help me in, in history. Well, write this down. Mm, we're not going to do that. And the other thing was, most of those, I mean, all of those tutors that they, they had hired for the athletes were poets. And you think I want to go tell a poet that I can't read? No way. That's just pushing your social life way out the window. Anyway, I get Dr. Uh, Gregory. How are we doing with that? Do I have time? I don't know where it's gone. Like two minutes. Two minutes, woo! I, I'll tell you what I'm gonna have to do. I'm, I'm gonna have to, I gotta tell you this other, do, okay. I'm talking to Tom right now, Kath. Negotiating a couple more minutes. Remember I was late. Uh, okay, I gotta tell you this. Because this is the extreme of, oh, that's a good point. Uh, he did it, and you, you're probably asking that, why would he do that for me? I told you he was shy. And I told him that if we pull this off, we would, uh, I would help him get a date with Mary for the spring form. And of course I did. I did help him. Uh, now, uh, it looks like I'm not going to be able to say much more. Okay, tell the last one. <laughs> quickly. Uh, okay, quickly. I had a professor that you were you were in school and the professor was it was final time midterm and two tests usually that's what it was and uh, he would stand up in front of the classroom and tell us uh, these things that were going to be on the test and if you could if you could if you knew this information you'd be able to pass the test so I knew he had the test I knew he had it in his hands the test was there just waiting for me. And so I went over there one night to his office. It's about 12 o'clock at night or maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. And he wasn't there. And so I crawled up on the, to the second floor. There's a ledge to his window. And I opened his window with a butter knife. And I went inside to see if I could find that exam. Yes, I did that. Now, I'm not just a cheat, I'm a burglar. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking for the exam in all the places, and I couldn't find it. And uh, he had cookies there, he had all kinds of nice little things. And I didn't eat any of the cookies, because I didn't come for the cookies. I came for that, from that, for that exam. And there was a file cabinet there, order of a file cabinet, it was locked. I said, it's gotta be in there. So I looked for the keys and uh, I left. And I went to visit the professor three or four times because he kept, he kept talking about these questions on the exam. I knew it existed and he wasn't taking it home, so it had to be in that file cabinet. So I went up there with uh, three of my friends and why would they do it? Sort of like, uh, help me actually carry the four drawer file cabinet out of the office, put it in the back of a car, throw it off campus to a, a, an apartment uh, where my friends live. And uh, I called, I'd already arranged for a night, uh, called for a locksmith 
and it costs a little bit more for them to come out in your middle of the night. They would come out. So he came out and he opened the, as a matter of fact, when I went to the door, I, we had already cleaned the, the student's apartment up to make it look civilized, you know, like civil people live there. And I was doing the Academy Award for this, you know. And I go there with a the suit tie and I say, oh, thank you for coming out so late. I really appreciate it. I got to be in L.A. Uh, tomorrow. And I had to have these papers. And he just probably saved my job. Not necessary, but it was part of, you know, uh, this mentality uh, that I had. So not only did I, uh, and I did get the, it was like about three o'clock in the morning. Now we get the pop cabinet and get it back in the office. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm feeling, remember Mission Impossible? That was kind of, that was, that was what the way I was feeling. And I, I went to, uh, the guys went back to their apartment and I went to, I lived in the athletic dorm. And in the athletic dorm, I went upstairs, laid my head down. And I was saying, Mission Impossible, mm, that was really clever. That was really great. You did a great job. And I laid my head down and I started weeping like a baby. Weeping like a baby. And they asked like no one. Because my parents didn't raise me to do that. That, was, that story is about the desperation, the desperation that adults have to get an education in that piece of paper. And maybe I. Maybe I thought I would get it through osmosis if I hung around the library and, I, and hung around the smart kids, but I never got it. And, and I, a quick, I'm, I'm closing. Uh, going back to my childhood, I can remember praying, Lord, tomorrow, when it's my turn to read, let the words come out. And sometimes I get up out of my bed. I was eight years old. I get out of my bed and pick up a book to see if God gave me one of those factors. And uh, we always pray for Zappers. And uh, he's got his own program and, uh, and, and his own time schedule. So I didn't get that. But when I was 48 years old, I got a volunteer tutor in, a, in a, an adult education program that helped me break the code. So I did get my prayers answered. And I'm here reading to you. I'm a literate person now. And I'm going to just get, just about get hooked off of here. Uh, <laughs> but I still don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to be with you. I trust that, uh, I trust you. Uh, and I believe that you believe like I do. And, and we have hope and faith. And we can, we can teach people to read the right thing. God bless you.